Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. As always, framing this podcast around living your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. This podcast started with the intention of teaching people muscle building and has evolved into so much more. If you're a regular listener to the podcast, you understand that muscle building is only 10 or maybe 20% of the topics we talk about. What we frame the podcast around is the six pillars of a lean, healthy, and muscular body. What are those pillars? Well, there's only certain things that we know we can do to actually impact the body and the mind in the greatest way possible. It's how we move, how we breathe, how we think, how we eat, how we sleep, and the environment in which we do all of them. And that's the six pillars of a lean, healthy, and muscular body. And we dive into those weekly with myself and Ashley and myself and these amazing guests from around the world to really bring you valuable information that you can apply to change your life. And hopefully you guys have been loving the podcast. I know the guests have been extremely diverse. I know I've been loving the podcast. I get so excited every time I get to interview a new guest and we're literally out there seeking the best people in the world. And today's guest is absolutely no exception. This is a man who inspired me to start a podcast, who inspired me to continue to grow a podcast. He's one of the podcasts that I first listened to when I didn't even know what podcasts were. And I continue to listen because I think he's providing a really, really unique opportunity for us to dive into some areas that maybe aren't common for us. It's this idea of biohacking. Dave Asprey joins me today to talk about his latest book, Superhuman. Dave wants to live to be 120 years old. And this book is about, actually correct me, 180 years old. And his book is about his practices, his best practices that he's found grounded in science on how exactly he's going to do that. He literally interviews the best guests on the planet, the brightest people in the world, the forward thinkers, the people who are thinking outside of the box. And he takes all that incredibly valuable information and condenses it down to something that you guys can enjoy every day. So I'm super grateful to have Dave Asprey join me today on the podcast. I actually went to his home in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada to record the podcast. We did a dual podcast where we recorded for Dave's podcast and I was on there. It's called Bulletproof Podcast. And Dave was so gracious to allow me to interview him around this book. So if you're interested in the idea of longevity and living an amazing life, not just a long life, highly suggest you check out the book Superhuman and also stick around for this podcast because you're going to love my conversation with Dave as he really opens up about everything he's doing in his life every single day to live to 180. Today's podcast is brought to you by Blue Blocks. You guys know I'm a massive fan of the Blue Blockers from Blue Blocks. And if you've never tried them, you know, everyone I talk to that buys them on our recommendation is coming and saying, you know, I didn't realize how much of a negative impact blue light is having on my light or just even bright light is having on my life. And, you know, if you wear these anytime after the sun starts to come down, whether you're driving or whether you're in your home and you're watching TV or you're in front of your computer or your screen or whatever it happens to be, you will absolutely notice a significant difference in your ability to sleep. And, you know, the idea of like leaving them on for half an hour and then taking them off, you start to pay attention to just how intrusive these lights really are. And grabbing a pair of clear blue blocking glasses is something I recommend during the day if you're spending a lot of time in front of your screen. And grabbing a dark red pair is something I suggest for anybody who tends to use a screen late at night. Ladies and gentlemen, deep sleep and REM sleep are perhaps the greatest thing you can do right now for your brain, for your nervous system, and for your recovery. So if you're someone who's lacking in those areas, if you find like you're stressed, if you find like your sleep is poor, um, maybe you have low level anxiety, oftentimes this is due to poor sleep quality or maybe some sleep dysregulation, um, definitely head over to Blue Blocks and pick up a pair of Blue Blockers. You can use the code Muscle Intelligence, dot com slash Muscle Intelligence. And we will hook you guys up with an awesome discount because you are amazing and we appreciate you. Enjoy the podcast with Dave Asprey. Dave, truly an honor. Uh, as I mentioned, as I came into your home, I, I've been a big fan for Quite a long time, actually. I started listening to your podcast, and as I told you, yours was the first podcast I ever listened to. I didn't know what a podcast was, and somebody sent me one of yours, and I've been a loyal listener ever since, man. So thank you for everything you do. You are really welcome. That's an honor. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, can I confess something? Shoot. I've never listened to a podcast in my life. I believe you. I believe you. So I don't ever listen to my or really anybody else's. It's usually yeah. a book or 
you know, having great conversations, but there's no podcast to listen to. The reason I like yours is you've got such a great, uh, insightful, scientific perspective and you ask great questions and you have great guests. So you're doing an amazing job, man. There's no doubt why yours is, you know, the best in the space or the top in the space. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. That's a huge compliment. So I would like to say that I'm a loyal listener of yours. The only reason that I'm not is it, this is a true statement. Time. I have kids yeah. and I have, you know, four companies and I write books. So like, where would I fit a podcast in my life? I don't know. So, you know, mine was always driving to the gym or, yeah. you know, uh, a trip somewhere. I'd always try to fit one in, you know, even if it's only 15 or 20 minutes, uh, I'm going to fit in that first little bit. And, you know, your podcast has always been you know, the great guests. And I love the, the bridge between the spiritual and the scientific. And that's kind of my approach, right? So I'm, I'm yeah. like the muscle building and the spiritual. Um, so you do like more of the biohacking, the spiritual? It, it's actually really cool, uh, your approach, uh, because even though I, I'm not a listener of any podcast, uh, uh, I, I'm familiar with uh, your take on things, right? right. And uh, it reminds me actually of one of the bodybuilding greats, uh, Mr. Olympia, uh, Frank, who was on the show. Frank Zane. Yeah. Yeah. And same thing. He's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm this, you know, wall of muscles from my life looking at all these things. And I, uh, I think it was plays the flute, if I remember the answer. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and he had this incredibly meditative, mindful, like kind of guru level yeah. perspective that came out of building muscle. Uh, so the fact that you're on a similar path like that, that's exactly it. The mind and body are one and you, you can't separate them out. So yeah, I think we're so connected with our body as bodybuilders that uh, there's a lot of time to go introspective when you're training, when you're, you know, you spend a lot of time alone, very introverted. So um, it's, you know, it seems like a natural evolution. And you get this as someone who's, um, you know, accumulated a lot of things, ascended a lot of mountains proverbially, whether it be accumulating money, there's, there's always that next journey because you realize I'm not quite fulfilled yet. I'm not quite happy. Well, what's the next mountain you have to ascend? It's typically internal. It, it's always internal. Um, it's, it's funny as an engineer, uh, I, I start, it was started it at my head. Like how do I make my brain work better? And then worked down into, well, yeah, I'm fat and my body doesn't work very well. And it's not for lack of trying, it's for lack of knowledge. But eventually you realize that there's all this embodied knowledge and, emotions and things that sit in your tissues that are outside the head that are part of what makes you who you are. So for me, it was a kind of a top down approach. Sure. And it, it sounds it like was the you, exact opposite. It was yeah, exactly. you're going to end up at the same place though. I think so. I think so. And I think one of my realizations was, um, the muscles are very much impacting the brain, right? There's a lot okay. of mild kinds that are being secreted to help us grow our brains. And that's kind of part of my messaging is letting people realize like, Hey, you can actually use athletics and, and training as a mechanism to improve your brain. You know, you're doing all these right. things to hack your brain. And I'm just like, Hey guys, here's how you exercise in a way that optimizes your brain. But I'd like to talk to you more about your spiritual journey because I think it's uh, you know really interesting before we get into the, the biohacking piece, which is definitely something I want to dive into is, you know, how it kind of started because you, you've done some really interesting things in your life, including spending some time in Tibet, some time with some uh, spiritual teachers and continue to do a lot of evolution of your brain. So if you just want to walk us down that path of like, you know, you said you had some brain stuff, some, some oh, uh, sure. limitations. I, I was really fat as a kid at arthritis, in my knees when I was 14, my behavior file in you know, middle school was, was like the thickest in the school. Sure. I'm like, Hey, I, I never threw a first punch. Right. <laughs> That's a true statement. Yeah. <laughs> I might have always thrown the last punch there. Right. right. And uh, so you could say I was, I was an anxious, uh, actually really anxious and angry kid, but I didn't know it. And I thought it was supposed to hurt when you walked right. because it always had for me. And I would get these, like, these nosebleeds all the time. And I never once made it through class without falling asleep. Every class, every day, I would just fall asleep in class. And they would yell at me and I'd say, what's your problem? I have an A. In fact, in high school, I had the highest grade in the, in the school. And so why do you care if I'm sleeping in your class? Clearly, I don't need to be awake. But the reality was that no matter how hard I bit the inside of my cheek, no matter if I'd pinched myself or what I did, I was biologically incapable of staying focused for an hour. And, and I, I didn't know that every other person wasn't also dealing with it. <laughs> I get you. So was that just strictly from your perspective, looking back a nutritional thing, or was it an environment thing? Obviously sleep contributed to that in yeah. some way, or it was, it was a combination of, uh, epigenetics. It was a combination of trauma and it was a combination of biology. And this is why Western medicine 
frankly pisses me off. I, I followed that path very strongly until I was 30. I did, you know, took all the antibiotics once a month, every month for 15 years for the chronic sinus infections. Wow. Just all kinds of stuff. The three knee surgeries with the screw in my knee that I didn't need. <laughs> all these things, all that pain, all that struggle, all that money, uh, and taking all those hits. Uh, it, it wasn't necessary, but it wasn't single variable. And we have this incredible idea that I'm going to find that one thing. It's like newsflash. As a computer hacker, early cloud computing guy, in fact, cameras, I'm putting at that poster behind you on the wall. That is the first shipping pay as you go computing service. In other words, that is the poster, the very first cloud computing before it was called cloud computing. That was my product at Exodus Communications. So that system, you cannot say, what's the one thing that's going to fix it? You're hurting cats right. and our biology and God knows our consciousness. It's also hurting cats. So I was dealing with all that stuff, but I, I didn't understand that. So when I sat down and said, Oh, what was the one thing? It was those three things. Probably the biggest one though, was a birth trauma. So you're like, what the heck is birth trauma? Right? Have you ever talked about that on your show? No, but I've heard you talk about it on your so I love you yeah, talking right. about it because I know your story. Okay. Now keep in mind I'm 6'4, I'm about 10.1% body fat. Right. I'm a successful entrepreneur. Yeah. I have an MBA yeah. from Ward and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. I like to think I'm believable. Sure. Okay. So I'm 30. I've just gotten out of you know five year bad relationship that I should have gotten out of after six weeks. <laughs> uh, and We've all been there, man. We've all been there. <laughs> I've made six million dollars and lost six million dollars. Right. When, and this is before I'm 30. And I've I told a friend at the time, I said, you know, I'll be happy when I have ten million dollars. To your point earlier, right? Yep. This isn't even possible. Like, what kind of a dick move is that? I don't know. I just make the explicit lyrics thing on your, right. on your iTunes. I don't know if you normally do that, but. Uh, it, it was just, when I look back on it, it was just impossible, but I'm sitting here going, I met this company, you know, we're at the forefront of making the internet grow. It was a company acquired by Akamai. Um, uh, and I'm miserable. Okay. Like I, I don't know how to deal with myself and I've done all the things that are supposed to work. Yep. I'm still not happy. I've had career achievement. You know, I've got some money, although I lost most of it, but you know, at least I'm driving a used BMW. Okay. Well, that's pretty good for Silicon Valley. Right. <laughs> And all that stuff. And a friend just looked at me and said, Dave, you have to go do this personal development thing. And I go, seriously? Right. Uh, I'm really busy. I have a job. You know, I'm just Don't splitting on Right. And what is it anyway? And she looks at me and she goes, I'm not going to tell you because then you wouldn't go. And that's really good reverse psychology uh, for someone like me. So I'm like, you're telling me I can't do it. I'll go do it. So I, I went and it just happened to be run by the... Uh, head and founder of the American Pre and Perinatal Psychology Association. You ever heard of that practice before? Uh, me either. <laughs> oh, dishwasher? Dishwasher. Oh, okay, we should be fine. All right, these should spill to that. <laughs> so her name was Barbara Fendison, and she, I walk into this room at a little hotel, and, and she's got these piercing blue eyes, like some sort of uh, Zen master or something. And I have no idea what's going on. I'm super engineering man. And I walk in and she goes, tell me about your birth. And, and I'm like, hospitals, vaginas. <laughs> I, like, like, <laughs> Who knows? Like, like, ew. And she said, no, do you have any, you know, do you have any details? I said, yeah. Uh, the cord was wrapped around my neck, but it didn't cut off oxygen. So, you know, no big deal. And she goes, yeah, that's what I thought. I go, what do you mean? That's what you thought. She said, you have it written all over you. I'm like, what, what does that wow. mean? And she pulls up this PowerPoint for me right there. And you ever see one of those boards where there's a, a butterfly kind of pinned down, you know? Yeah. It, like, she had my entire, like, all this stuff that no one could ever know about me. It just, she already knew it all. It just from that one fact. I'm like, how could you possibly know this? And, and she said, the reason that, you know, you have the anxiety and fear and shame and guilt and all that kind of stuff it's built into your biology. It's because you came into the world thinking something was trying to kill you and your nervous system got set up that way. And you know, since then I've interviewed 600 and something people and like yep. Stephen Porges, the father of polyvagal theory, yep. um, figured out, Oh yeah, the vagus nerve is tied to this. The brain is tied to this, the muscles, even the way your cells decide to make energy or not. So for the first 30 years of my life, I'm like, all right, there's something trying to kill me. I didn't think about this. I didn't know this was in there, but it was in there and it affected my stress response. It affected my sleep and it affected the way I would act in a corporate setting or in high school. 
It doesn't really matter. You're always on that high alert, slight anxious. Yeah, and, and you're looking for someone trying to kill you, so yeah. you can punch them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not that I've ever, as an adult, done that. Everyone gets in school scuffles. I guess they, they don't anymore. Right. Being in a school scuffle, they arrest you and throw you in jail when you're eight. That's horrifying. Um, but what I what I, I did discover was that I was way more reactive than I wanted to be and that, and that I knew I was. And so I've got to learn more about this because suddenly... I learned at the same event, it was called the Star Foundation, by the way, if people are, are wondering, it was a 10 day thing. Uh, one other thing happened that I think your listeners would care about. They were doing some sort of weird, this is all transpersonal psychology, which is the created by Stan Groff. Yeah. Um, and Stan's also been on, on my show. He's amazing. Have you interviewed him? No, but uh, he's not listened to everything he puts out. Okay. He's 95 now, I think. So lucid and sharp. Oh, amazing. We did an event with him, uh, with the Bulletproof, or it's now called the Human Potential Institute, yeah. um, the, the coach training thing um, that that I started. And it's 9 o'clock at night. Okay, most 95-year-olds that I know oh, cool. can't hang at 9 yeah. o'clock at night, much less have an interview on stage. And he just nails the whole thing. And he, what he figured out was the stages of birth, <laughs> which traumas happen where, and how they affect your personality. And this was you know, 40 years ago, and it's percolated through the fields of psychology. I was unaware of any of that stuff. And it maps over almost perfectly to what you learn in old traditional Chinese medicine, in Ayurveda and yoga, in shamanism and all that. So these are now scientific observations. It's pattern matching stuff going on saying, what are the things that happen when we're not looking inside mm -hmm. ourselves? And how do we develop tools to look inside there? Right. Uh, and uh, for me, that's uh, that was a big awareness. So why was I unhealthy? Because my nervous system was not paying attention to me. It was paying attention to killing stuff. And then you're that amplifying that by probably blaming everyone around you, thinking it's their fault when really this is what most people do, right? Are you saying bad things about me? Yes, I am. <laughs> you're a terrible person. To... Well, that's not, so I live the same life, right? And this yeah. is why my mission is what it is. Is you know, there's, there's millions of kids out there yeah. doing the same thing. And, and mm -hmm. you know, when I say kids, it's anyone up to 21 years old and probably even older adults uh -huh. um, doing the same things that you're doing. And they're, they're externalizing all these things and saying, well, it's everyone outside of me. All these, it's, all, it's, it's becoming the victim and it's saying everyone, it's everyone else's fault. And you finally realize that it's not. It's pretty much always your fault. Yeah. It, it's interesting. I may totally anger you or some, some listeners here. Uh, and I, I was into bodybuilding, not at the professional level you right. were. But especially in my my late teens, early twenties, okay, I'm 300 pounds. It wasn't muscle. Right. I'm like, oh, go to the gym, and and I did the gym thing. You know, 90 minutes a day, hour and a half a day, yep. um, super hardcore, trying to lose the fat and just making sure I wouldn't have another knee surgery, and it, it didn't work. Uh, and there's all sorts of reasons that it didn't work. But um, I learned, and, and I've noticed that a lot of people are attracted to both MMA and bodybuilding because they're defending themselves. Compensatory mechanism. Like, yeah. I admit to that 1000%. Yeah. It's, yep. it's like, I never felt safe, but if I'm a walking hollow muscle with a giant beard and tattoos <laughs> everywhere, I'm hey, going to be making fun of me. Now I'm going to be Come safe. On. It's, not, it's a small beard. <laughs> not right. a giant beard. There you go. I'm working on a giant beard. <laughs> covering myself in tattoos. <laughs> but, it, it, that, and that's not pejorative because I was like one of those guys. I'm like, how can I like look tougher? How can I be tougher? How can totally. I be meaner? Like, I don't feel safe, but I didn't know that I didn't feel safe because that was always how I felt. Yep. And when you drop that, all the energy that goes into protecting yourself from non-existent threats, I think that's you might use that for personal development or starting a company or having a family or just being a good person or just watching Breaking Bad over and over. It doesn't, it's like free energy. Yep. That's why I started a neuroscience company. That's why I had to get my biology in order to get enough energy to overcome the resistance to personal development. That's really what it's all about. So you're not in any way insulting you or the listeners because that's the messaging that I'm saying. It's like yeah. it's not about the muscle, right? It's the person you become in the process yeah. is, is, my, is my message. It's not about the muscle, yeah. but I'll tell you straight up. If your body doesn't work right, it's incredibly difficult to overcome a trauma. Most people listening are saying, I don't have any traumas. I'm like, look, let me be really straightforward. Let's assume that many people listening were breastfed. Right. There was a time when your mom was like, for God's sake, you've bitten my nipple 50,000 times. You're old enough. You're done. Right. Okay. That it's was like traumatic because you're like, I want the boob. I didn't get the boob. You were traumatized. Yep. Okay. Is that that one time your dad came home from work and was really tired <laughs> and got fired that day and you didn't know it and you wanted attention. You didn't get it. You were traumatized. Okay. It stuck in your pattern matching system. It has nothing to do with how good of people your parents were. Nothing to do with anything except old biological processes looking for times when you had strong negative emotions and trying to figure out what caused them and making sure that you don't have that again. 
So that's what traumas are. It can also be, you know, I was assaulted. I was bullied. That's a huge thing for MMA and, uh, yeah. and bodybuilding. And hell, I was bullied all over the place. You know, you're the, the tallest kid. You're going to get bullied. It always happens sure. by the shortest kids who always bleed when it's over. Right. And as a parent, you talk to let your kids cry it out. I'm like, yeah, we want them to sleep in their own bed. Just close the door, let them cry. Right. Yeah. Like I'm thinking about that. Like that's just an emotional trauma waiting to happen. It is. It's not a bad thing. It's just, it's just a reality of, of everyone's life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so with my own kids, we did everything we could. We co-slapped, we reduced the traumas they experienced. Right. It's not that they don't have adversity, but if you have adversity and failure without trauma, you build resilience. And if you have adversity and failure with trauma, you learn to do anything to avoid failure at all costs, which means don't take risks. And, and so it's just basic logic, but you have to have the framework to apply the logic to. All right, man. That's a great place to start. But I want to know how you got into, hey, man, I'm, I'm going to travel to Tibet. Like, how did that come about? Right. And, and like, yeah, let's talk about that. You you reach a certain point where it's, okay, I did the heavy duty exercise. I did antibiotics. Uh, I've gone to the doctor and said, I feel like someone's poisoned me. Like, I, I do not have energy. My brain isn't working. Uh, and I bought disability insurance in my mid 20s. Right. And I passed all the lab tests. There was nothing wrong with me. I assumed it was just like, I'm morally weak. I'm just not trying hard enough, but like, I don't know if I can do this. The accelerator is pushed to the floor and I'm slowing down and I can push harder, but there's no more room for the accelerator to go. And, right. and it's not like I'm dumb. It's not like I'm without willpower, but I thought it was a moral issue. And I started figuring out these things in the environment around me that, that affected me, that I could on off of maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe this stuff actually matters. And after I did that uh, personal development retreat where I realized, Oh, there's something going on below the neck. That's useful. Like there's data in all that crap. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe I should learn more about that. So I went off to uh, China. This is part of my business school thing at Warden. At the end of that, we, we went there uh, to go visit a friend who'd commuted from China to San Francisco for two years. So we went over to see her and my friend Jane. And from there, I said, you know, I'm already here. I just, uh, you know, just got out of a relationship. I am now in uh, kind of a state of freedom. I'm between jobs. I'm just going to travel. So I'd wanted for years to go to something called Mount Kailash. And if someone listening to this is from India, <laughs> you know about Mount, Mount Kailash. It is a famous place. It's Mount Olympus for both Hinduism and Buddhism. And no one's ever climbed it, and it's where the gods are supposed to live. But to get there, you have to get to uh, Tibet and the, the capital there, uh, Lhasa, and then you have to drive for five days on a dirt road in a four-wheel drive uh, where there's a, a driver and a, uh, an interpreter um, who's there basically to make sure that you follow the, the laws of China. And you go like for days, and you're sleeping in these little mud huts, and you're eating food cooked over yak dung just to get there. And then you walk a 26 mile circuit at 18,000 feet elevation. Uh, and I, I had just read about it in outside magazine many years ago and said, this is the most remote place on earth. How could I not want to go there? So wanting to learn meditation from the masters in Nepal, which is much easier to get to than Tibet. I did a, a 10 day uh, meditation learning session at a monastery there. And, you know, lots of uh, silence every day and eating a diet that makes you fart like no one's business and isn't conducive to meditation. Uh, sorry. Right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, for their biology, it is, but maybe not ours. Right? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, they have people coming from all over the world. I can just tell you, you sit in a room full of silent people meditating for two hours. I can tell you it wasn't just me. Right? <laughs> so uh, and news to people, beans and meditation may not work for a lot of people. <laughs> anyway, we uh, from there. I said, all right, I want to do this forever. I'm actually right next door. I've got to go do this. And sometimes when you set an intention like that, it magically one of the people in the meditation group says, hey, I want to do that too. And to go to Tibet at the time, you had to have two people on a visa. Uh, so I, uh, I, you know, we got on a bus essentially and drove to, uh, drove to Lhasa. And what's really interesting and relevant for what I do now is I, in, in Nepal, I'd done a lot of trekking and I had descended 7,500 feet in one day. That's vertical feet. Yeah. And even with trekking poles, my knees were wrecked. Uh, in fact, the doctors had told me like, Dave, you'll be, be grateful. You can walk. You know, you've had three surgeries. You're not even 25. You know, things are kind of messed up down there. But at the end of that day, I was so bruised and just inflamed in my cartilage. I couldn't walk. 
I, I almost like to get coffee across the street, two trekking poles. It was like, I felt like I was really old and I was worried I wouldn't be able, when I, when I got to, I wouldn't be able to actually walk anywhere. So along the way, you'd stop in these little tiny towns and there's only one restaurant and you sit in these big shared rooms uh, where the beds are five feet long and I'm six, four. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect fit. <laughs> and so I said, I need collagen to feed my, uh, feed my knees. Like just, I need the molecules to heal. So I asked, uh, Jerry, a guy from Beijing who could read uh, Chinese, can you read this menu to me? And he, he says, pig's ears. I'm like, Oh God, that's collagen. I've never eaten a pig's ear. So I get a bowl of these things. They're served cold. They boil them and they're just sitting there like, like maybe a dozen nasty cold pig's ears. So I ordered some soup and I dipped them in there, warm them up and chewed my way through. But the next day I could walk. My knees regenerated overnight. I just had to have the basic sulfur and the connective tissue and the collagen that was in those things. And it's one of the reasons that I said, you know, collagen is a really important thing because I suffered so much in my joints that when I came back, I said, I, I'm going to talk about collagen as a high performance, meaningful supplement. And that's why collagen is all rage today. It's not just the topical beauty stuff. Sure. It's, it's a protein powder that you can buy now. It's certainly the Bulletproof makes. Um, it was because of that experience, just seeing what would happen from really screwed up knees to the next day feeling better. It seems like it's very polar opposite. Maybe it's just a reflection of your personality, but you went from someone who was really focused on, you know, being in your head and accumulating things to someone who switched into pursuing this spiritual optimization, this body optimization. Do you remember a specific time in your life or was it more of an ascension to go from, hey man, I have no, no regard and concern for how my body functions and I'm not really that much of a spiritual person to becoming, you know, what seems like now is the exact opposite. You know, you're a well-integrated, balanced person. Is there one time? Was it that going to that 10 day retreat? Probably the 10 day retreat just told me that there was, there was something going on More that I had been aware of before that though, if you immerse yourself in you know, the corners of the internet, looking, especially going back 20, 25 years, no one would talk about cognitive enhancement and smart drugs. No. And I found the people. In fact, one of them's been on my show. Steve Folks wrote yeah. the first book on that, smart I've drugs. I've listened to that podcast five times. <laughs> He's such He's a brilliant amazing. guy yeah. and, and a good friend. And one of the things where getting the wisdom of your elders, and he's got 20, 20 more years of experience than I do. And you talk to people like that and you learn stuff that, that you know, wow, I, I, how, how is this possible? But you realize that over time, you know, you and I are developing that same level of wisdom. So that was a, one of the things that made a difference for me with, was spending time with people like that who'd written about things that no one would talk about. But anytime you'd see people talking about smart drugs, you'd also see people talking about mushrooms, LSD, psychedelics. Yeah. psychedelics. And then you also had uh, center point. You remember center point with Bill Harris? Hmm. I dedicated uh, it's headstrong. Uh, one of my books to Bill Harris, he passed away. Yep. Um, it actually might've been game changers. I think that was the book. Um, and Bill Harris is one of the most preeminent brain hackers out there. He'd been using special sounds. He designed, I actually designed some, some sounds for, uh, one of my companies, uh, as well, um, that I haven't even released yet. But what he had done is figured out for, for hundreds of thousands of people, if you listen to these sounds, you can tap into some stuff in your deep subconscious. Uh, so you come across that and I'm going, wait, you mean I can listen to these weird tapes? Yes, tapes. Some of this was 25 years ago or CDs or whatever. And you realize that the more you pursue cognitive performance, the more you end up looking at the weird spiritual woo woo stuff because you cannot actually turn your brain up all the way without tapping into these altered states of high performance. And the real reality when you look into this is they've been studying this in Hinduism, in yoga, in China, uh, even in South America. And, and in fact, the first chapter of Superhuman, I write about all these different lineages with saying, hey, how do we live forever? How do we perform better? And it's well documented that small numbers of people, the corner case people, they can do crazy stuff that looks like what superheroes can do. And the more you're pushing a limit, whether it's physical or whether it's emotional, spiritual, uh, or even cognitive, what you're going to find is you end up going into one of the states of high performance or you're not a high performer. Yeah, I think the simple reality is most human beings, and call it 99%, focus a lot of their energy, if not all of their time, outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. So I'm focused on accumulating and focus. And I think the world is intentionally designed that way. So we become materialistic. 
but the people who take a minute to stop and, and spend a little time internalized, focusing on what, what it feels like inside their body, can then start to go after and access those states. Because you know, until we learn to stop and breathe and, and quote unquote meditate, not to use the term, but any type of internal reflection, any type of internal uh, mindfulness allows you to then realize those transcendent states exist. And then anyone ultimately who spends enough time doing it, as you say, will find those states. I'm not sure that anyone will find all the states. Not all the states, but yeah. some of them, perhaps. You, you or can. realize they're there. And what I've, what I've learned from starting and running 40 Years of Zen and from 20 years of neurofeedback before that, mm-hmm. working with a, a variety of, of partners, like traveling around the country and doing neurofeedback with different experts, um, the first thing I learned was it's not a good idea to do brain surgery on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a story behind that one. <laughs> well, I, I mean, with high quality clinical gear, the stuff that, that I use, if you don't know what you're doing, you can give a healthy person PTSD, including yourself in a very, like in an hour or two of, of training. So you train up parts of the brain that shouldn't be you train the wrong frequencies. So what did I do the first time I did neurofeedback? Uh, 1996, 97, I went uh, to this, this chiropractor's office in the Bay area and, you know, wired myself up and, and he you know, showed me some very rudimentary stuff, but I saw a kid in the, in the lobby and this kid runs up to me and just starts screaming, he just runs in a circle around me like 30 or 40 times. And of course it jars the heck out of my, uh, traumatized nervous system. It, essentially it's PTSD. And this is the birth relays that I'm talking about. And so I kind of go in there jangled. Well, I come back a few weeks later and the same kids in the lobby. I'm going, Oh God, like I don't want to be in this room with this kid. And he just walks up and goes, hi, my name is Bobby and shakes my hand. And I'm like, what just happened? Well, his brain has shifted so much. Okay. This stuff is actually doing something that is remarkable. I know now that was an autistic child who had already shifted his behavior patterns. And that's sort of neurofeedback or electrical stim was neurofeedback. neurofeedback. Yeah. It's just, uh, uh, looking at brain waves and playing them back to you so your brain can improve itself. Yeah. Uh, so that was what set me on my path, but there are definitely times when I went out from that. So I'm going to buy my own gear. Like the heck with that. Uh, and then I said, well, there's a lot of stuff I could train. So I studied, okay, what, what are the things I want to do with everyone? One of the things I don't, the problem is that if you are, trying to fix your eyes, let's say, and, and you were to give yourself LASIK surgery and you did it wrong, you're not going to be able to fix it because you can't see what you did because right. your eyes don't work. So if you change your consciousness, you change your brain, that's a problem. So I learned what are the things you can train safely at home? And it's a relatively limited set. What are the things that should be highly customized for your brain? It's a different set. And I, I found huge results uh, for me of going down that path in you know, my neurofeedback company is called 40 years of Zen. And um, what I've found from that is there are certain brains that are, I'm just going to call them super brains. These are people who came into the world. They can do stuff that you and me can't do. Right. Um, I've interviewed several uh, shamans from different indigenous peoples and I've gotten at least one of them to just straight up admit I, I, the question was, Hey, if I go to Shinoa Maxwell, I'm thinking of, uh, I said, Hey, so you're telling me you can tap into all this stuff. You can see these things. I don't really see those things. Like I know my energetic abilities. I know what I can do and how, you know, what kind of the control system. I feel like I've got it mostly wired in, uh, it's continuous improvement, but you have these things. Can you do this because of your genetic lineage? Cause of your heritage, or can you just do these? Cause that's who you are. And you probably have these three super brain states that are going to be easiest to achieve with what you've already got on board. So that's the challenge. So what does that look like when you say super brain from a brainwave perspective? Because we've had some experts on to talk about, you know, waking delta and theta and, and alpha and even gamma at some levels. And you mm-hmm. say you can kind of quantify these super yeah. states. Do you have some kind of signature? Oh, yeah. It, it's a very it, it's a very old perspective to say, oh, you have to raise alpha in the brain. Sure. Yeah, I get right. It. And so that's been known since the early 70s. Yeah. And the thing is, though, what does raising alpha in the brain actually mean? Maybe just decreasing beta, ultimately, right? Well, Absolutely. and you could also decrease delta and take the electrons that went into delta and put those into into, uh, into alpha. In fact, I I could show you someone's brainwave from 40 years of Zen where their delta dropped by more than 50% and their alpha went up correspondingly. Because at the end of the day, you only make so many electrons in the brain and they're going to go into whatever waveforms the brain wants them to go into. 
the the difficulty though is more that how are you measuring alpha and alpha is this state that allows you to be relaxed and alert and if you're fighting or like in an intense situation you're going to be in beta and if you're daydreaming and tapping into your unconsciousness you're going to be in theta but you have that's the right the right uh, order of magnitude for this i'm going to say billions of neurons although don't trust me on that number i'd have to actually check uh, the exact number of average neurons that people have because it changes with age anyhow a very large number yeah. <laughs> of neurons in the brain and when you look at how those neurons are uh, are firing you want to know which waveforms are firing at what time and what waveforms are riding on other waveforms so the old school approach is oh you had to have lots of alpha in the back okay. this is because we couldn't tell you had alpha in this one point in right. the back so what what I'm doing, and when I'm talking about these super brain states, is we're using a 24-channel clinical grade system, which can, by advanced math that you can do on a modern computer that you couldn't do 20 years ago, we can actually figure out, oh, this one point in the brain is communicating with this other point in the brain. Those two are synchronized. But it's not about, oh, the left half and the right half are matching each other. Right. That's like... It's, it's, I'm going to paint the Mona Lisa with a roller brush. Right. You, you can't do that. Yeah, it's just neural circuitry. circuitry it's, it's neural circuitry. Yeah. And to be able to say, okay, we know, for instance, that gamma, which is a state associated with, um, with uh, advanced Zen meditators, which is a target that we're doing at 40 Years of Zen. The idea is, okay, what if you spent a lifetime of daily meditation? Can you get to those same states in five days? And the data that I have says, yes, you can. And you have to be able to measure gamma and train gamma. And we do it and we do it reliably. But gamma itself, if you think about it, it is a very high speed, 60 or 100 hertz you know, times a second. So it's a tiny little wiggle. And it's not going to just wiggle in nothing. It actually sits on top of this maybe one or two hertz delta wave. And then on top of that, you have other things. So it's sort of like nested Russian dolls of brain waves. Yep. And it's a different perspective than a lot of neuroscience has. And the point of 40 Years of Zen is that we developed custom hardware and custom software. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, in fact, we have two different versions of it combined with other things like quantitative EEG, like uh, transcranial electrical stimulation, like pulsed electromagnets, <laughs> and in some cases, even acupuncture and other stuff like that, uh, heart rate variability, a whole suite of technologies around figuring out what's going on in the brain and being very precise about for you to have a super brain. This part of your brain has an unusual level of delta and gamma in combination when it talks to these three other points in the brain. And you just can't do that if you're saying you have to raise alpha. It, it, it's sort of, yeah, like your body weight. How much do you weigh? Well, is it all fat or is it all muscle? You kind of want to know, but sure. increasing weight is like increasing alpha. Right. Is there anything people can subjectively look for to optimize like i don't have you know if i don't have access to 40 years of zen my listeners mm -hmm. is there anything they could subjectively look for that we like hey that would be one of these states that we're trying to yes to, to look for a little bit more in order to feel what act what alpha feels like it's really really easy and it's free all you have to do is close your eyes and look uh look up and kind of look at right at the spot behind between your eyes about an inch or two above your eyebrows uh, where your third eye would be if you had a third eye. So you just, as soon as you close your eyes, you're going to want to go into more of an alpha state. And as soon as you look up right there, that will naturally raise alpha. And if you do that and you take a deep breath, you can do a box breath, which is you know, five seconds in, hold for five seconds, release for five seconds, hold for five seconds. Or you could do uh, what Andrew Weil uh, proposes. Uh, he was just on Bulletproof Radio. Yeah. And Andy, Andy Weil is a, a very famous father of alternative medicine. Yeah, he's amazing. He, just a great human being. Yeah. He teaches a four, seven, eight breath. We breathe in for four, hold for seven, out for eight through the mouth and the, the first two are through the nose. Any of those kind of slow controlled breathing things while your eyes are closed and you're looking up your forehead, that's going to introduce you to alpha, which is this bridge state that lets you feel like, oh, um, this is what lets me, me be awake, alert, not hyper aroused and not completely slopping off into daydreaming. Now, that's alpha. If you want to know what theta feels like, that is actually daydreaming. And the problem we have with theta is that you usually don't remember what happens in theta. 
it, it's a it's a difficult thing to do. And one of the things that I'm working on right now is a piece of software uh, that we'll be releasing uh, probably through 40 years of Zen that allows you to actually train your memory when you're in that theta state. And it's a difficult thing to do because if you're daydreaming, it's just you wake up and you say, well, hold on, I didn't tell anyone, I don't remember. Another thing, if you want to feel theta, when you first wake up in the morning and you're in that not quite asleep, not quite awake, that's a theta state. If you're in a delta state, you won't know it. Uh, it's just kind of how it is. And uh, so that's, if you have an aura ring, for instance, that's the deep, deep sleep. And the only time you've ever felt a delta, a delta state it's probably when your kids jumped on you in the middle of a deep sleep cycle and you're like, oh, and you just feel wrecked and you just can't come out of it. You're not really feeling Delta as much as you were there. And the step from Delta into waking function for me, that'll ruin my whole day. I still haven't gotten around that. It takes me at least two or three <laughs> hours, lots of coffee, uh, deep breaths uh, just to feel normal again. That's why I'm pretty careful about how I wake up. So we hear a lot of interesting things and I don't want to talk, spend too much time on this about waking Delta. Yeah. So it's like, is that something you guys are measuring there? And is that something that you see happens in a lot of people? You know, there are, there are, all brain states are always present in all brains. It's just a question of degrees and location. So there's some sort of mystical things that are talked about with waking Delta. We all have waking Delta all the time. <laughs> it's, it's a common thing. The question is how organized is the Delta? Where in the brain is it? And there's actually a lot of bad stuff you can do with neurofeedback. Like people say, oh, alpha is, uh, you know, alpha is this really amazing thing. You should have more of it. But if you have eyes open alpha and you have a normal brain, you're probably going to be dysfunctional. But if you have a special brain, you have eyes open alpha, it's probably good for you. Right? so well, which, which is it? Well, you have to know your starting point. And when you get to delta, it's the same sort of thing. Some people, when we look at their brains on a, on a clinical grade system, they have masses of delta just floating around all the time. And then they do some of the reset process that, that I teach at 40 years of Zen. And magically, their delta can drop by 50%, right? No one can even tell you exactly why that is. But I can tell you that if you train the wrong state of alpha, and there are facilities out there that will train broad spectrum alpha, some of those cause mild seizure-like behavior in the brain. So you get like a weird flashing feeling and they can actually be destabilizing. It's one of the reasons that we, we took that out of the alpha that I train. Um, another thing that happens is when you, when you dig really down into the delta, if you train someone in delta, which most neuroscientists won't touch, it can be very, very destabilizing. So I, uh, I tend to steer away from training delta unless you find, oh, in a, in a healthy brain, this one of the you know 100 plus uh, nodes in the brain that we train, this one is just massively low on delta. We need to train that up to normal levels. And what we'll do is we'll say, we're sensing this and we'll ask a person questions. Do you, do you have these behavioral things? Do you have these, these feelings based on which part of the brain it is? Are they a problem and do you want to change it? And if they say yes, like, okay, we're going to change the settings so you can train that up a little bit so that you can feel the way you want to feel, you can perform the way you want to feel. That's waking Delta, but it's not the sort of like, oh my goodness, you're trying Delta everywhere. That's not a good move. Delta is there for low level, uh, low level functioning of the body. It's where hormones and growth hormone things are released. That's generally a sleep thing. And you don't want to be asleep when you're awake. Switching gears a little bit. You've, you've written a book, you know, many books in the last five years, but superhuman, your most recent one, focusing on ultimately living the longest, best life you can. Uh, and that's really what I want to dive into is, is understanding kind of what you've determined over the last maybe 15 years of your life to be the biggest rocks that are uh, you know most influential in allowing us to not only live a long life, because I mean, that's wonderful, but living a great life. I want to thrive. I want to have abundance of energy and, and focus and, uh, you know, ultimately happiness. So, you know, maybe talking about the few things that you mentioned there that you would, you would maybe document as the biggest rocks in optimizing quality and quantity of life. But Superhuman is uh, right now my, my fastest selling book. And it was the first book to be on the New York Times list for multiple weeks. And it struck a chord with people. And the reviews have been, have been really good about that. Because if you want to live a long time, who wants to be old when... <laughs> That's no fun. No one wants to be old uh, because your picture of old is 
you have very thin skin. Yeah. You can't walk around at your own power. You're wearing diapers and there's tubes stuck in you in places where there, no tubes should ever be. Right. right? In, in fact, and you don't know your name. I forgot that one. If that's your picture of aging, you'll probably die earlier because you don't want to go there. No one wants to go there. It's a normal thing. Mm -hmm. So what's going on? Well, what's really happening there is your picture of aging is completely broken. So I talk about this as look at the wisdom of your elders. Look at what happened in tribes and in small communities throughout history. It's that as people age, the ones who don't die become the sources of wisdom and knowledge that handed down to the children, the grandchildren, the great grandchildren, and they're revered and they've accumulated a hundred years of pattern matching and they can pass it down to us. And this is why I, I talk about um, various people that I've interviewed who are in their nineties. This is why I've run an anti-aging nonprofit group for 15 or so years in, in Silicon Valley. It's because I learn from people twice my age because they've been places I haven't been yet. By definition, I can't be there. Uh, and this is why I hear that, that stupid, okay, boomer stuff. I'm like, wow, you want to close off learning from people? Like I'm, I'm not a boomer. Boomers are my parents, but I will spend as much time as I can with boomers because you know, they've got some arrows in their backs, right? And they already, they went through everything I've already been through, right? And they went through everything that you went through when you were in your twenties, right? Including all the angst and anger and all that other BS. So uh, what I do is, is I say, how do I maintain my youthful energy? And I spend time with people younger than me, right? How do I keep that spark, that level of interest? So that's actually the first part of superhuman. Like, here's the deal. If you think being old sucks, you won't get old. Or if you do, it'll suck. So you got to change your mindset. You are healthy. You move around with your own power. You have a brain that works. And you are able to give back because you finally have dealt with all your shit. Right? Like, that, that's age. And then what do you do? <laughs> The first step is don't die. There's four things that are going to kill you if you just do the math, right? It's type 2 diabetes, it's cancer, it's Alzheimer's disease, and it's heart disease. And if you can lower your odds of those things, just even a little bit, your chances of dying go down dramatically. And your chances of having a crappy life for the last third of your life go down dramatically too. So you must address those. And after that happens, okay, that'll get you to 120 if you just avoid all those things and do some basic stuff. And we know... Because people are 120, not that many of them, but we, we can already do that using the historical 120 years of technology. Now, is it crazy to think that you and I who are relatively young, relatively healthy and able to eat what we want to eat and basically create the environment around us the way we want it to be? Is it crazy to think that in the next 100 years of technology that we might do 50% better than today's best? No, absolutely not. I think it's <laughs> actually reasonable. I, I think it's actually stupidly conservative. Right. I'm saying that number because it sounds it sounds so out there that, that people can barely grasp it. And the, in fact, one of the chapters in here, I'm talking about collagen in your skin. And if you look at the rate of collagen loss over time, we've all seen uh, really old people have very thin skin that tears easily. There's an equation that describes how quickly you lose collagen unless you do something about it. Like, what are the things you can do that are going to cause you to have thicker collagen so that you don't have, I did the math, if you lived 180 and you follow the current curve, you have about 18% of your collagen left in your skin. Like you'll be able to see your organs. Right. right. <laughs> so you're going to have to address these things. And you can do that with light therapy, which ranges from very affordable. Uh, one of my companies, um, True Dark, that makes the glasses I'm wearing, makes some, some things, some light therapy devices that have an amber frequency that has a difference on the skin as well as the red and infrared. Uh, and there's all these different things you can do that will affect that, including what you eat and what you don't eat. And science has now figured out there's seven causes of aging that we know to be true. And when you address those seven things, you don't have to do it perfectly. You don't have to spend a lot of money on it either. What happens is that aging is death by a thousand cuts. It's not one thing that makes you old. We know these seven pillars that you have to maintain, they get weakened over time. But what would happen if you took less cuts, they were not as deep, and when you took a cut, you healed like Wolverine instead of just sticking a bandaid on it and hoping it got better. That's how you lived on your knee. I love that. <clears throat> I love the first point there, and that makes me think of Dan Sullivan, this idea of redefining your uh, image of old age, because yeah. I think that's so important. We all have a skewed vision of like, well, I'm going to look like my grandpa or my grandma or whatever, and that's important. And I think creating that paradigm in your mind first is, is vital. And I'd love for you to talk about, if, if you remember them, the seven things that are going to, the kind of pillars of old aging. 
Is that something that's in your book? Yeah, yeah. All seven pillars are in the book and what to do about them. Yeah. Now, if I couldn't remember all seven pillars, you'd have to say, Dave, I think your stuff's not working, right? Right. So let me go study real quick. Right. Okay. <laughs> I know what they are. Uh, at least I, I believe I can pull them all from memory. Uh, in, I'll probably get the right order, though. Um, that's not how my memory works. So one of the things is telomeres. And a lot of people have heard of telomeres. And I kind of like to think of it as a, a candle wick that burns out every time a cell divides, the telomeres get shorter. You run out of telomeres, you can't divide your cells anymore. It's called the hay flick limit, and then you die. Well, we can lengthen telomeres. And I talk about the free things you can do. I talk about the medium cost things, and I talk about some of the more expensive things uh, that are out there in the universe of biohacking that will solve this problem. And okay, that's one of the seven pillars. So now your cells can divide more times than they could have before. One of the difficulties we have is that telomeres change at different lengths in different tissues in the body. So people get a blood test and they say, oh, uh, I got older, I got younger. And you do the test again a month later, I gained 10 years, I lost 10 years. That didn't actually happen in 10 days. So what's going on here is blood levels fluctuate relatively quickly. Your blood cells are only in your body for about at four months. They replenish themselves every four months. So that's, uh, we'll say there is no correlation done that I've been able to find that says if your blood looks like this, your brain or your muscles or your heart will look like this. That said, we know that you should have longer telomeres and the blood's probably a good marker, but it just might not be a very good way of measuring it. So I do a variety of things that are in the book to lengthen my telomeres. Then we have things like stem cell exhaustion. You run out of stem cells. And I've done probably the most extensive stem cell therapy ever done on a human at one time. And Dr. Harry Adelson. Who's, yeah, who's, Dosier, I love him. He's been on my podcast. Oh, he's been on your podcast. Yeah. Okay, so your listeners know about Dr. Harry from Dosier. Yeah. He's in Park City. It's amazing. He's an amazing guy. Have you been to see him? And you, no, but okay. we're, we're working on you, him. Here. You've got to go see yeah. him. And I mean, I was unconscious for four hours. They took my bone marrow out and I did videos and, and talked about it all on, on the radio show and some of it's in Superhuman too. But every joint in my body has had stem cells. And um, inside my brain. So they flew in a Johns Hopkins a neurologist, Marcella, who's been on the show as well. And it's called the whole body stem cell makeover. This is as much as a Tesla. I mean, it is an expensive thing to do. <laughs> Not cheap. Uh, I drive a seven year old car, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I, I believe that some things are more important and youth is, is incredibly important. Uh, I, I did feel a huge improvement from doing that. And this is what the millionaires and billionaires are doing. Physical or cognitive or both? It's both. both. But also I had my stem cells like inside my brain, which is an unusual thing to do. And they do that into the cerebral spinal fluid? Yeah. And also alongside, along the inside of the spinal sheath, which is pretty unusual. And as well as male reproductive organs, obviously male ones, because I don't have female reproductive right. organs, but you know. And has, uh, did you feel benefit from that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've had a variety of things done there. And uh, Dr. Amy, was she the one, Dr. Killen, she's done the show as well. She's okay. Amy's awesome. been on the show. Okay. Awesome. So I, uh, I've been working with those guys for a few years now and I invited them to speak at the Bulletproof conference or the, the biohacking conference. Now it, we spun it out from Bulletproof. It's part of upgrade labs, but it's, it's this, this amazing thing that you can get younger. So we've got telomeres, we've got stem cells, uh, and you're just full shout out. That stem cell stuff is amazing at, at Doser. Uh, and then we've got um, other things like mitochondrial mutations. And a huge body of work. In fact, my my science best selling book, uh, Headstrong. Strong. Love that book. Great book. Thank you. Highly recommend it. It's it's all about mitochondria, what they do in the brain. And I talk about one of those seven pillars being how do you keep those working so they don't mutate. And after Superhuman came out, this theory that I've been uh, proposing in here actually got proven. And it, as as a science guy, when you're saying this is how it has to work, and then someone does a study that says this is how it does work, it's uniquely satisfying. Uh, and it, there's always a risk of saying, I think it works this way, but then you could just be completely bald sure. wrong. So what I, uh, what I proposed was that when you have enough energy in your cells, that you will be able to properly fold proteins and do the repair systems, uh, repair things better than otherwise. Because as far as we can tell, through a, a mechanism we don't really understand, there's a hierarchical list where the body figures out where to put an electron to do the most good. And some of the algorithms that are personal development oriented that are at the core of 40 years of Zen are around you know, fear, food, reproduction, and you know, these other things that are hierarchical, but inside your body, I have one electron. Do I make testosterone? Do I make growth hormone? Do I do autophagy, right? Or do I run away from something? 
the cell knows based on an algorithm. And so there's a distributed system that emergently decides elegantly which priority your body is going to put things towards. Well, this new study came out that showed that when you have enough energy, enough ATP, enough electrons made in your cells, that your mitochondrial energy will go towards repairing your nuclear DNA. And this had never been proven before. So now that thing says your cells will mutate less because one of the other causes of aging is your nuclear DNA mutates. It just doesn't do it nearly as much as your mitochondria. So now we're saying fix the mitochondria. It'll actually cause your cells to repair themselves, which reduces your cancer risk, which is phenomenal. Uh, so we go down uh, that path. We've got uh, uh, mitochondrial uh, things. We've got telomeres. We've got stem cell exhaustion. There's debris inside the cells, uh, which is something that happens where you imagine you have a furnace, something inside the cell called a cytosome that burns extra proteins and things like that. And if you're on a high protein diet, say you're a bodybuilder, you're eating more protein than I recommend in superhuman because it's, it's how you're hacking your body. It's what you chose to do. Right. And what that means though, is that if you have pieces of protein that the cytosome can't burn, it's like a furnace where you never get the ashes out of there. Eventually it's so full of ashes that it stops working. This is one of the seven pillars of aging. So my proposed way of handling with or handling that here is regular fasting, which can help. But if some of the stuff is clogged up and you're fasting, it's not going to fix it. So what if you ate less of the things that broke your cytosomes? And it's that protein. It's not just protein. It's particularly burned protein and advanced glycation. Uh, products. Yes, yes, yes. So if you were to say, look, I'm going to eat a high protein diet and I'm going to sous vide steam or lightly cook or eat a lot of sushi you're going to have a very different outcome than if it's barbecued and deep fried. And so when you get these, these, I'm sorry, I have to just say this, these dumbass vegans <laughs> saying the amount of animal protein you eat, oh, I'm sorry, spider venom is animal protein. Right. And you don't eat very much of that to die, but also sarin or sorry, ricin, the nerve gas is a plant-based protein. You don't have to eat much of that to die. It's the most toxic compound known on earth. So you can't say animal based protein or plant-based protein. It's stupid. To say that you have to say what protein, how is it raised, whether it's raised in toxic soil or not, whether it's an animal or not. Okay. How is it prepared? How is it stored? And then what's it going to do to you? And, oh, and when did you eat it? That matters too. And so it, it's, these are meaningless distinctions. It's like someone says, you should go on a liquid diet. You're like, okay. Oh, the liquid's gasoline. Like, oh, maybe that's a bad idea. Right. It, it, these are terms that are just like, they're just thrown about. I'm plant-based. What, what does that even mean? It's and, completely mindless and dogmatic. Yeah. I, I just eat, I just drink diet soda and eat corn chips. I'm plant-based. Like that's not good. We all know that. Right. So let's just be more mindful of this uh, as well. So part of that there is you got to look at whether it's plant-based, animal-based, whether it's burned and burned vegetables and oxidized oils are also going to be damaging your cytosomes. So now we got, I think that was four. Mm -hmm. We've got extracellular debris. This is things outside of the cells. And this is one where fasting can, can make a huge difference. And toxic metals can be inside or outside the cells. There's a chapter on toxic metals because the older you get, the more metals will accumulate and the more your risk of every one of the four killers goes up unless you're consciously and regularly binding the metals and excreting them. Are you doing that with like chelation or anything specific or yeah. obviously the protocols are in there, but chelation is the only way yep. that we know of to do it. So one of the simple things is, well, if you don't eat fish, you're probably not going to like your life. But if you do eat fish, you're probably not going to like your the life. life. <laughs> mercury, yeah. So when you eat fish, eat the low mercury fish yeah. and take a handful of chlorella with them. And uh, years ago, when I was doing yoga in Palo Alto, I, I figured this out. If I had sushi and then I was doing a one-legged closed eye pose, so you, you stand on one leg, close your eyes, normally people fall over. Mm -hmm. I got to where I wouldn't fall over unless I had sushi the day before. Like, wait a minute here. So I do sushi with a handful of chlorella. It's a fractured, a fractured cell wall, green algae that we know binds tightly to mercury in the gut. So it doesn't go into the brain. I do that. I don't fall over in yoga. And um, that story has been sort of widely told on the internet. Lots of people are, are saying, oh, I had this experience. I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Uh, but uh, I, Kenny Graham was the yoga teacher when that happened. I remember it really well. And it's... Uh, it's phenomenal how just noticing what happens in your environment and then drawing correlations and then testing it can show you, show you things like that. So now we've got intracellular, extracellular, and then we've got something called cellular stiffening. And this is an area where I'm really, really interested. And if you look at what happens when you get a scar or a callus, 
That's a stiffening at a big level. Mm -hmm. Well, when you have systemic inflammation inside the body, the cells get something called amyloid buildup. We've all heard of amyloid plaque inside the brain for Alzheimer's. It's beta amyloid. But there's other amyloids everywhere. And the more amyloid you have, the less flexible your cells are and the more of a problem they are. And in a recent interview on uh, Bulletproof Radio, I talked with Dr. Terry Cochran. And she explained how, oh, if you eat these advanced glycation end products, these are brown, things like caramel, <laughs> things like brown sugars or barbecued uh, things or any kind of sugar that's been heated or carbohydrate that's been heated or meat that's been burned, but it's primarily a carbohydrate issue. Um, what you end up with is uh, a higher level of these uh, compounds inside the body, these amyloids. And... Fascinatingly, you get exposed to a toxin in the environment like toxic mold, which is endemic in our home environments. That then causes bacteria to form a biofilm. And this can happen in the gut. It can happen in the sinuses. I was exposed to toxic mold a lot as a child because I lived in a basement and I had the symptoms of that. When you get a biofilm, the biofilm itself is bacteria self-organizing into colonies to live inside your body. They will then create lots of amyloid. So now it's not just what you're eating. It's that you have an onboard generator of these compounds that make you old. And when there's extra amyloid floating around, there's viruses like CMV. And these viruses will grab the amyloid, surround themselves with it as an armor plating, and then they'll hide inside the body. So these amyloids are a big deal. What do you do? Reduce inflammation. Don't eat so many inflammatory things. And reduce other causes of inflammation. And what happens is you'll actually age less quickly because of that hierarchy. It's a fascinating thing. But bottom line is burned food is really, really, really bad for you. Cooking is okay. Burning is not okay. And who would have thought? But now we know. It's just lower heat uh, cooking. Yeah, mechanisms. lower heat really matters. And so I think that was six, six things. Uh, we had cellular stiffening, mitochondria. All right, what is the other one? Stem cell exhaustion, we had that, which is also tied to sarcopenia muscle loss over time. Uh, what is the seventh pillar? Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Tremendous. And I think that's enough uh, <laughs> kind of dangling the carrot to give people the you gotta read it to get the other one to get away. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I'm going to go out and read it now. Cause like I think anyone at some point in their life, mm -hmm. and I think it's age dependent becomes aware of their own mortality. But let me ask you one question. Um, I, and I write about this in superhuman and I went really deep on this, but what's your take on testosterone replacement? The only answer that I ever give to that is who, for who, right? <laughs> exactly. For who and, and what is your current scenario? And, yeah. and, and as you will know, is oftentimes it comes down to why is your testosterone low? And is it yeah. an energy thing? Or uh, is it, you know, in, in my case, in case of a lot of bodybuilders, we were taking things in the past that have shut down our natural production. And that's a different scenario, I yeah. think, than average people. But most people, are, from my experience, are going to have low testosterone because of the excess inflammation, because of the excess yeah. body fat. And I'd much rather address the cause rather than the symptom. So uh, I don't think it's something that we should just kind of ubiquitously say everyone should take. It, it, it doesn't make sense to me because I think pushing up one hormone can often cause negative side effects if you haven't addressed the yeah. root cause. Everyone shouldn't take testosterone. Yeah. That said, everyone over 40 should measure their testosterone levels and plan on taking it at some point. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And my thing is, is, and you get this, is it's not about quantity necessarily yeah. of life, it's quality of life. Yeah. If, if I can't have sex or if I don't have a sex drive or if I don't feel energetic and my testosterone's in the toilet, well, that's one, that's one pillar that you should be looking yeah. at. I had most of the diseases of aging before I was 30. High risk of stroke and heart attack, arthritis, cognitive dysfunction. Um, so the list goes on and on and on. And I'm still on testosterone. I went out for three years when I was researching the Bulletproof Diet to see what the effect was. And I could... Keep myself right at around six, seven hundred. I feel That's better at nine hundred. I feel better at nine hundred. Yeah. So I'm, I've got a paladin right now, and I'm damn grateful for it. Oh, interesting. So, I'll be honest. Like I went off for you know, eighteen months after my bodybuilding career, and my my testosterone mm. was twenty seven. It tanked. Yeah. Not later, I, and I, I didn't feel terrible. That's twenty seven on the Canadian scale. Uh, that no. can't be twenty seven on a scale of one to a thousand. U.S. scale. So oh my god! Know. So you were like, you were like, like a twelve year old girl, yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> or lower. <laughs> uh, and, that, and so I checked it, and I was like, all right, this because uh, I was trying to get to come back. Like I didn't have, I didn't want to, you know, kind of be obligated to do anything. I have one of these personalities where, like, if I if I'm obligated to do anything, I don't deal really well mm -hmm. with it. 
Um, but I'm just like, listen, I feel way better. So I like to balance myself up very much like you somewhere in the realm of like 800 to a thousand. And I just sit there. So I don't use a pellet because I've seen some stuff that says pellet tends to make your test go up and go down. Do you feel that? Or do you feel pretty consistent with it? It's the most consistent that, that I've seen over the course of the four months of pellet Toward labs. the end of the duration yeah. of the pellet, there's been some data that says maybe it drops down and your rate, your ratios get all whack. You haven't seen that. Well, what I do is I put them in one side and at three months, I put them on the other side. Got it. So, so you're, you're beating it. Yeah. So okay. I, you're if hacking you, it. Ironically. If you were to use, you know, say, uh, I think I use four pellets now. I, I was using five. I went down to four. So basically you use a slightly lower number of pellets, but you sort of replace them side by side right. so that you're going to get a... A waveform so, where the, the trough is how on a scale of one to ten of pain, what are we talking? Oh, for injection? I feel things? like it's like someone running at you with a pencil from across the room, or is it not so bad? Oh, it's much less than oh, that. Okay. I mean they they give you a little shot of lidocaine and oh, okay. it's one stitch. It's a tiny little incision, they stick the thing in. When they say pellet, I'm thinking it's like horse tranquilizer, someone's gonna rat at you from the other side. Of the no, room. you I, you do you do have like a little bump where the pellet is. Like yeah. I, I had a guy come in a couple of weeks after, like a massage therapist, and he's like, you know, a muscle knot. I'm like, don't massage that muscle knot, that's a <laughs> testosterone pellet. Right. And um, the reason though, I mean, you have two kids, I have two kids. I used cream when I was younger and testosterone cream is amazing. You put it in your armpits, but then like, you get greasy armpit hairs. So you're like, yeah, I don't really need armpit hair anymore I anyway. Like that's, right. that's, um, causes deodorant stalactites anyway. Um, so I, I was like, I'm just going to shave my armpit because that's the best place to put it unless you put testosterone cream on your testicles. perineum yeah. and testicles. And I, I just love having like kind of greasy testicles hanging there all day long. <laughs> like, no, right. Right. That said, it works really well. And if you want to be really good about it, well, just, you know, put it rectally and like gross, like you're going to yeah. have to feel that all day long. You, just, you don't want this, right. but if you're using cream and it gets on your sheets, there's some left on your hands and you touch your kids, yeah. it can affect them way more because they're sensitive to tiny levels. So like, I don't really want that. So for me, it's either inject you know, three times a week, which isn't a big deal. It's a tiny little thing. You barely feel the needle yep. or and I do subcutaneous, not intramuscular. The data is actually, you need less testosterone subcutaneous than right. in the muscles or um, you, you can use a gel as well. Uh, the advantage of the cream though, is that it has a secondary use as scream cream, which is, uh, which is useful. Uh, I missed the joke. Scream cream. You don't know what scream cream is? No. Oh my God, this is a gift for you. <laughs> okay. And and there's actually compounding pharmacists who will make this for you. Okay. You take a vanishingly small amount of testosterone cream. Uh, we're talking, you know, like a, just a, a little drop, like a finger that like you put lotion on your finger and just a little bit and you rub it on the um, labia, uh, vulva. I got where you're going the after you started the, okay. the small it, amount. It will cause insane vasodilation like you've never seen so much blood rush to that region in a woman ever and, and almost immediately uh, within five minutes wow and you'll hear things like what are you doing to me oh my god <laughs> every man's going to the pharmacist right now <laughs> doc <laughs> yeah and i mean ethically you of course would talk with your partner and be like hey like we're going to try this little thing but it is especially if um your partner is in perimenopause or after but it doesn't really matter their age it will it will create a very um, a very positive experience for the vast majority of people. Have you ever experimented PT one four one? The uh, the peptide? Yeah, I have not tried PT one four one. I'm wondering if it's on the same level. You may want. Well, well. There's a few other peptides. You know, for uh, that's for women. You're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't. Um, for guys though, um, and you probably know this from your bodybuilding time. Um, melanocyte stimulating hormone MSH. Yep. You played with that. You ever injected it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If you want to walk around with just like uh, constant know, spontaneous erections, yeah, constant kickstand, uh, yeah, that yeah. stuff is ridiculous, and yeah. it also so that's what PT one four one is. It's actually the the segment of the peptide that causes the sexual arousal. Oh, it's it's part of the okay, but yep. without the tanning. Got yep. it. So MSH is a really fascinating anti aging hormone. Uh, so you and I know about it because it can give you a tan. Right. Really, you have to be tan. So you inject the stuff. You go in the sun for a day and you got a tan. It's mm -hmm. ridiculously effective for that, and when you use it as an anti-aging hormone, it turns out that it's opposite of your melatonin cycle. So you wake up, you take it in the morning, it'll enhance the quality of your sleep cycle. Huh. If you take it at night, it'll mess with your sleep because it competes with melatonin. They never told you that in bodybuilding school, did they? No. <laughs> I just took it before I went in the sun. I know it made it, you know, heads up, it makes you nauseous. If you, if you, you take too much of it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I would always take it, you know, midday and go have a nap or in the morning or something. Yeah. Um, have you experimented with peptides for, for longevity, like epitalin? Is it in the book? It's all in the book. Yeah. I have been using peptides for many years. Epitalin, pinealin, um, there's a long list of them. 
And peptides are short sequences of amino acids that the body uses for signaling. And every day we're finding more and more and more of these things. And the drug companies are trying to patent them. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. guys, sorry, these are present in my body already. You don't right. need to patent the compounds that I already have. You have to modify them to make them probably toxic before you can do that. And then I don't want to buy them. So this is a, a renaissance in understanding the human body. And most of this came out of Russia. It's really cool. The chapter on telomeres uh, as one of the seven pillars of aging. You can spend two, two to three grand a month on a, a, a Chinese herb, or actually it's also an Ayurveda, uh, an extract of it called astragalus that will raise your levels of telomere, uh, telomeres. But for 50 bucks, you can inject <laughs> some peptides that do the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I like that. I like that route. And, and peptides are an amazing thing as an anti-aging thing. So they're in here. But MSH is also in here because inside your brain, there's a store of, mel uh, of melatonin. And inside the back of your eyes where there is no light, and scientists call this junk melatonin. Or sorry, junk melanin. And this stuff, it turns out, has weird electrical properties. And what it can do is it can turn vibration and heat into extra electrons. So these are essentially capacitors inside the brain. People are exposed to toxins. People have chronic stress and chronic inflammation. Their MSH levels will drop. You can, you can use it by injection occasionally, and your zest for life goes up, your cognitive function goes up, and possibly even your vision could improve, although there aren't studies on that. So that's why I'm a fan of it. All right, I'm going to turn this around on you and ask you the one final question of the episode. I'm going to do with Dave Asprey. But, um, so we've talked a lot about living a long life, and I think that's very, very valuable, and I want everyone to run out and get superhuman. What I want to ask you is what are your pillars of living a happy life? So if you had three things that you would tell all of our listeners right now to live your happiest life, what would that be? Uh, the first one is definitely a feast on the blood of your enemies uh, once a week. Once a okay. <laughs> hey, man, write that down. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm going to talk about what, my, uh, what I do with my kids at night. Yeah. And I sit down, usually at bedtime, it's like, tell me three things you're grateful for. And having a regular gratitude practice where you sit down and say, what happened? And here's what's missing from most people's gratitude practice. It's, you can say what you're grateful for, but you can actually focus on the sensation yeah. of gratitude. Yeah. Gratitude is, is a embodied feeling. And so you just sit there and like, where is gratitude inside me? Is it in my heart? Is it in my gut? Is it in my kneecap? I don't know, wherever it sits for you. But if you feel that, when you turn on that feeling, the more you do it, the stronger it gets, just like putting on muscle. And then you can feel gratitude. And so when you're feeling really crappy, which happens even to me on occasion, you know, it doesn't matter how, how much personal development work you've done, how many books on personal development you've written, like, you can still have a bad day. Yeah. So having that gratitude thing, massively, massively important. I could have been grateful that I had $6 million when I was 26 that I lost when I was 28. Or uh, I could have said, I'll be happy when I have $10 million. I, I went the latter, which was stupid, right? And so you can be grateful that you have what you have. And if you say, there's nothing to be grateful for today, here's a look down. You have both legs, be grateful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, it's that, that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, second thing to be happy is the through line throughout all of my work is this algorithm of life. And this is uh, just original things that, that came out of my consciousness after writing headstrong about mitochondria and single cell organisms do this and you and me do this. And it's the three F words. It's you will spend the most attention on something that your body believes could kill you right now. That's fear. You're going to run away from freeze or fight. That's just how we are. That's where your attention goes. The second thing is food. We're going to spend a huge amount, maybe three times more attention than it's worth on what am I having for lunch? Right. Unless we're satisfied there. And the third thing is, if I don't reproduce the species, it's the end of the species. Therefore, I'm going to go out on that date that I really shouldn't go out on, right? I'm going to do all sorts of things that I probably shouldn't do, including pornography and whatever else. So if you understand this about yourself, you have these three F words, right? Gratitude will turn off. Call the last one fornication. I, I was thinking fertility. <laughs> right. <but> yeah. <laughs> and it might be another F word, depending on where you go. Uh, but um, what, what you want to do is... Gratitude addresses the first one, fear. Because if you're in a state of gratitude, you can't be afraid. The second one there, food, learn how to eat. If you eat and you're hungry and two hours later, you did it wrong. <laughs> vegan. I'm sorry. Um, I'm <laughs> I was going to say it. But there, there was something in my throat there. It was probably a garbanzo bean. 
<laughs> By the way, I eat way more vegan than most people. Sure. Like my, yeah. it's a plate of vegetables right. with a with moderate water. amount of highly mm-hmm. ethical meat on yeah. there that contributed to soil growth. And like, a good like, amount of fat. And, yeah. Yep. Like, like it, it's it's way more in alignment with the let's not harm plants for the planet than people would think. But anyway, yeah. I, I got to say what I believe to be true. But here's the deal: if you're hungry, you're doing it wrong. And if you can go eight, 10, 12, 16 hours without eating and just feel like you're okay, you're doing it right. It will radically change your happiness levels to not be thinking about what you're going to eat all the time. I think it's also important just to add to that, that people realize that it's okay to be hungry. Yeah. It's not like, it's not a life or death situation. If people yeah. feel a little bit hungry and I have to eat now, I have to panic. And that, that's you know, just an, an awareness to bring to everybody. It's yeah. like, when you feel hunger, smile and say, thank you. My body maybe is burning some fat and my body is maybe producing some ketones and ch- changing that association you have with fear, with um, food. It, it's one of the most important things you can do. You're not going to die. And I tell it to my kids too. Um, each of them has one time said, I'm not going to eat the broccoli. My kids actually like broccoli, but you know, they, they, they act out and I just look at them and go, Oh, you've decided to try intermittent fasting. You won't starve to death for at least 60 days. So you don't need food at all. Tell you what, I'll put my food away too. And we just don't have to eat. This is awesome. And they'll just look at you and eat their broccoli. Right. Like it's fantastic. Right. So th- that, that fear of starvation and most parents have it. So they, then their kids can boss them around around food. And so in terms of being happy, okay, I've learned how to turn off fear with gratitude. I've learned how to turn off hunger with mindset and with just eating the right stuff and not eating the wrong stuff, right? And then the third one here, if you want to be really happy, uh, learn how to be a really, really good lover, right? Fornicate every morning. For, what does that have to be every morning? <laughs> and there's stuff in Superhuman and in Game Changers around, for men especially, Frequency of ejaculation. If you ejaculate too much, it's probably going to make you age more quickly. Like once a day? Uh, just once an hour. No. It's a, <laughs> it turns out it's age dependent. There's an equation that comes from Taoism that I tested for a year and it seems to hold true. And it's age in years minus seven divided by four. And that's going to yield a number. It's, for you, it's probably around like seven or something. Mm-hmm. So what that tells you is that you can have as much sex as you want, but seven times a day. No, <laughs> once <laughs> every seven days to maintain to maintain your age. Right. And so you're like, what? How could that be possible? I'll just tell you. There's a voice in your head that says, if you don't run away from that thing, you're going to die. If you don't eat that thing, you're going to die. And if you don't ejaculate right now, you're going to die. You got to own all three voices if you want to be happy. Love it, man. Brilliant, Dave. Thanks, ben, man. Appreciate thanks, it. Man. And that's a wrap, ladies and gents. I hope you loved my conversation with Mr. Dave Asprey of the Bulletproof brand. This gentleman's a CEO, absolutely crushing in life. And he's really doing a great job balancing. And after having been out to his biodynamic farm in Victoria, Canada, you see that Dave's really living the life. He's a great dad. He's certainly really, really, you know, maybe neurotic about the way he eats, but I think he should be. And this podcast is brought to you by Blue Blocks. Head over to blueblocks.com slash muscle intelligence and use the code muscle, M-U-S, CLE for 15% off blue blocks. Um, blue blocks will absolutely help you reduce eye strain. If you're sitting at a computer all day or even watching television, and we know that high amounts of light exposure, whether it be blue or otherwise can definitely contribute to emotional dysregulation from poor REM sleep. Um, they have fully tested lenses and that's the big difference maker with blue blocks is some people are offering, you know, $7 blue blockers on Amazon but they're not, they're really nothing special. They're not going to provide any actual tested lens quality. We want to have the best quality lenses for our eyes, protect those eyes. And Blue Box is going to give you guys free shipping around the world. So head over to blueblocks.com, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com slash muscle intelligence and use the code muscle. Have an amazing day. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.